Great. Awesome. All right, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody, depending on your time zone. I'm Carl Fippinger, Vice President, Fire and Disaster Mitigation in the International Code Council's Government Relations Department, coming to you from the Washington, D.C. area. We'd like to welcome you to our webinar today in celebration of Building Safety Month. We've got a great crew here to talk to you and uh, some very important information to share. Uh, the title of our session today is FEMA's New Building Code Strategy and Hazard Mitigation Programs that Support Community Resilience. A quick reminder for folks that unfortunately this webinar does not qualify for ICC CEUs today. This is informational and we very much appreciate you joining us on behalf of not only the ICC, but our family of services companies at the bottom of this slide. Just a quick review on Building Safety Month. So we're currently in week three, which is May 16th through the 22nd. Uh, disaster preparedness is our weekly theme. So very fitting, but we've, uh, we've had a great time so far kicking off with energy and innovation in our first week. Building safety careers in week two, and we're very much looking forward to water safety as our theme for week four. Uh, and we encourage you to stay with us throughout Building Safety Month um, for all the information and, uh, and great resources that we're able to provide to you. So I'd like to do some quick introductions of our speakers, and I'd ask that uh, you turn on your cameras to join us here. So uh, I'll be your moderator today. And I'd like to introduce uh, Angela Gladwell. She's Director of Hazard Mitigation Assistance at FEMA. We're also joined by Edward Latch, Director of Planning, Safety, and Building Science Division at FEMA. Our good friend John Gargiola, Lead Physical Scientist in the Building Science Branch at FEMA. And also uh, Jonathan Westcott, Civil Engineer, uh, also with John Gargiola in the Building Science Branch at FEMA. Thank you all for joining us. Uh, just a quick note to everyone, I wanted to place a, a, a thank you and a special note to our specific week three sponsors, uh, Simpson Strong Tie and State Farm Insurance. Without their, uh, their contributions and help along the way and the resources that they provide, uh, we would not be able to bring you all of the great and fantastic things that we do for Building Safety Month. So please check them out. And also we've got a, a full listing of our sponsors uh, on our Building Safety Month webpage at buildingsafetymonth.org. So covering our agenda today, I'll be very brief on this. Uh, we, we're here to talk to you about a few things. Uh, we're gonna start the uh, agenda off with uh, Angie Gladwell. She's gonna uh, give us an update on FEMA hazard mitigation assistance programs. Uh, then we'll transition into our folks from Building Science where they're gonna talk to us about FEMA's brand new building code strategy uh, and, and, and how that will affect not only their work uh, within the agency, but some of the changes that hopefully you'll be seeing uh, over time out there on the ground as you work with building codes and standards. And then finally, we're leaving about 15 minutes at the end of our presentation to be able to do moderated Q&A. And this is the portion of the program where I encourage you to go to the Q&A feature within WebEx, uh, queue up your questions, uh, that never too early for those, uh, and we'll be glad to either answer those live or we'll park them for the end and we'll get through as many as we possibly can in the last 15 minutes of our presentation today. So without any further ado, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Angela Gladwell. So Angie serves as the Federal Emergency Management Agency's or FEMA's Director for Hazard Mitigation Assistance in the Mitigation Directorate within FIMA or the Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration. There won't be a, a quiz on all of that terminology because we're not offering CEUs, so you're in luck. But uh, Angie directs FEMA's hazard mitigation assistance programs, including the new Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program, or BRIC, the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program, Flood Mitigation Assistance, and, and others in the portfolio. She, uh, she co-chairs the Interagency Mitigation Framework Leadership Group, or MITFLAG, as we know as an industry term that coordinates mitigation and resilience, not within just within FEMA, but across the federal government in consultation with state, local, tribal, and territorial partners, uh, as well as the private sector. So welcome, Angie, and take it away. Okay, thank you very much for that, that kind of introduction. It's a pleasure to be here with you all this afternoon uh, uh, talking about our hazard mitigation grant programs and uh, one of my, my favorite topics, uh, it, which is building codes. Um, I've been around FEMA for, for quite some time. I've 
been with FEMA for a couple of decades now. And one of my previous roles, I was with, a, uh, with our building science team over in the risk management directorate. And so it's exciting to be able to um, build off of all the important work that they're doing and bring that into hazard mitigation assistance grant programs and see how we can continue to um, really um, uh, support and, um, and lead the way in, uh, across the federal government in grant programs that are supporting the adoption uh, and enforcement of building codes. So next slide, please. So um, hazard resistant building codes we know are the key to reducing losses. And throughout our history, FEMA has funded over um, uh, close to 100 building code projects totaling close to $100 million through hazard mitigation assistance grant programs. The growing frequency and intensity of natural disasters make the need to adopt building codes even more urgent. And we believe that strong standards will reduce the vulnerability of structures to hazards. Because of this, as you'll hear more about later on the webinar, FEMA released the building code strategy which aligns with the recent White House proclamation, focusing on strengthening the nation's infrastructure and improving climate resiliency. So today I'm gonna to speak briefly about how building codes are a key part of FEMA's mission and the National Mitigation Investment Strategy and how Hazard Mitigation Assistance, or HMA, is leading the way across federal grant programs and prioritizing building safety and mitigation investment. I'm gonna then pass it off to our team who's gonna dive into more depth in the FEMA building code strategy. Next slide. FEMA's mission is to help people before, during, and after disasters. Within the Federal Insurance and Mitigation Administration, our goal is to reduce disaster suffering. We're focused on delivering our hazard mitigation assistance programs with equity, as we look to increase the resilience of all communities with a focus on the future impact of climate change. It's with these focus areas in mind that FIMA developed its three-year strategy, which you can see outlined here. This strategy incorporates the cross-cutting principles of equity and climate change into all aspects of its forward-leaning goals. We also must look at resiliency of the entire community and identify the right resources and partners to reduce risk holistically. What our FEMA administrator refers to as system-based mitigation. System-based mitigation involves a combination of land use decisions, strong building codes, infrastructure upgrades, nature-based solutions, and mitigated residences, among other solutions to make communities more resilient to future disasters. Addressing this problem holistically will help make communities more resilient in the long run, especially for disadvantaged populations who find themselves facing impacts from disasters over and over again. And I mentioned a key adverb here, collectively. FIMA is dedicated to executing on our three-year strategy to reduce risk holistically for all communities, but we can't do it without the support of our partners. We invite each of you to join us in this mission. Next slide, please. In addition, I want to share with you the objectives in the uh, FEMA 2022 through 2026 strategic plan that show our commitment to building climate resilience while also increasing the capacity of communities. Building codes is an important aspect of all of this work. Next slide. Climate change has both acute and chronic impacts. Communities must be resilient against threats as varied as extreme flooding, drought, hurricanes, and wildfires. Most relevant to our conversation today, many communities are faced with aging infrastructure, which can increase risk from major disasters. As the frequency of these disasters accelerates, FEMA must increase climate adaptation investments across the nation. Research has shown that every dollar invested in building to the latest codes and standards results in $11 of future avoided losses. FEMA has already taken steps uh, through the Hazard Mitigation Assistance Program, such, in the, such as in the Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities, or BRIC grant program, 
which prioritizes significant or innovative infrastructure projects and encourages the adoption and enforcement of disaster resistant building codes through its prioritization criteria by funding the development and enforcement of building codes as part of its capability and capacity building activities and through its non-financial direct technical assistance, which is newly created under the BRIC program. So our fiscal year 2021 BRIC notice of funding opportunity priorities include increasing funding to applicants that facilitate the adoption and enforcement of the latest published edition of building codes. So by adding specific points to our competitive, the evaluation of our competitive projects, we are putting building codes at the front and center of our program. In addition, we fund capability and capacity building activities, which build the knowledge, skills, and expertise of communities to expand or improve the administration of mitigation assistance. Building codes is one of the activities supported through this element of our program. And communities can also request non-financial direct technical assistance for the support. We recognize that some communities struggle to even get their foot in the door in accessing our programs um, due to capacity limitations. And so this non-financial direct technical assistance allows communities to submit a simple email to a, uh, an email box to say that they need assistance, and that assistance can include support for building code uh, adoption. While prioritization of funding projects and technical assistance to modernize building codes is available through the BRIC program, we also want to let you know that building codes and standards are also eligible projects under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program. As you may know, August 5th is the deadline to apply for the $3.46 billion available as a result of the authorization of the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program for COVID funding. This is available across all 50 states, three tribes, and five territories, and the District of Columbia, and the first time ever that HMGP has been available nationwide. It's a joint responsibility to ensure that all of our investments are built for future needs and risks and we want to continue to use our funding to incentivize building code adoption and enforcement. Next slide, please. Mitigation investment is extremely important. As a few other associations articulate on this slide, financial projections to protect our nation against climate change are staggering. The Biden-Harris administration, however, has accelerated much needed funding for mitigation around the country. The administration has allocated billions, either on an annual basis or over a five-year period, to promote and advance a number of initiatives and programs meant to tackle the climate crisis while simultaneously advancing equity in our grant programs. Since the launch of the 2020 BRICS grant program, the administration has quadrupled that funding, to which, which helps FEMA prioritize significant or innovative infrastructure projects and encourages the adoption and enforcement of disaster-resilient building codes. Additionally, as I mentioned, the administration made $3.46 billion available through the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program within the COVID-19 disaster declaration. The Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act adds an additional $5 billion over five years, $3.5 billion for flood mitigation assistance program, another billion for BRIC, in addition to the 6% of the disaster relief fund set aside that already exists, and $500 million for the new Safeguarding Tomorrow program, which is a state capitalization grant now under development. We also have $154 million this year in congressionally directed spending for pre-disaster mitigation for fiscal year 2022. Next slide, please. System-wide approach to mitigation requires the public and private sectors to work together so that every investment is building for the future. FEMA's National Mitigation Investment Strategy was developed to be a single strategy for the whole community to more effectively and efficiently advance the practice of mitigation investment in the U.S. The goal of the investment strategy can be realized through the recent increases of funding that's been made available. And I want to emphasize why the investment strategy is so critical and what it's hoping to accomplish. FEMA is working to establish guidelines to access the significant influx of funding and one of the objectives of the investment strategy is to collectively invest in addressing priority needs. 
Otherwise, we're not substantially changing the outcome and how disasters are impacting communities. So not only do we have to address the needs in the current environment, but we also have to be collectively smarter about how future risk is shaping where and how we're developing. With the focus of the investment strategy, we're moving towards a more coordinated approach to mitigation investments across the country. And one way we hope to make progress in this space is to utilize existing touch points, such as our annual meetings with our state partners to identify areas for federal and state alignment. Next slide, please. In addition to what's available following a disaster under the Hazard Mitigation Grant Program and public assistance, the BRIC Grant Program is another key program through which we can help communities build capabilities and capacity for building codes regardless of a disaster declaration. As I mentioned previously, the BRIC Program can fund projects to help advance the state or local communities building codes. A number of applicants took advantage of this opportunity to apply for and receive funding under the fiscal year 2020 BRIC grant cycle for capability and capacity building. Examples include the City of Hartford, Connecticut received a grant for improving their building code enforcement. American Samoa received a grant for the adoption of the 2018 building code. A tribal nation in Alaska leveraged BRIC for building code implementation and many more. We're excited that these communities, including some underserved communities, are taking advantage of BRIC funding uh, to advance building codes. Not only do these types of projects build the community's capability and capacity, but they also make them more competitive for other types of BRIC grants in the future. Similar opportunities are available in the fiscal year 2021 grant cycle and will be in the future cycles as well. Next slide, please. Fortifying our nation's resilience to natural disasters exacerbated by climate change is a shared responsibility that begins with mitigation planning and priority setting at the state and local level. The federal government has its role in delivering the funding of grant programs, and to be successful, we must all work together at every level of the government. Encouraging the advancement of building codes is an important part of this effort. And so now I want to turn things over to the building sciences team who will share more about the FEMA building code strategy. Thank you very much. Angie, that was great. Thank you so much for coming back and visiting with us again. I know you're certainly not new to the ICC uh, building science or this audience. So we thank you for your time today and, and, and taking time out to come and see us. I'm sure there will be questions in the chat, particularly around BRIC and maybe some of the other mitigation assistance programs there. So we'd, we'd love to have you stay with us and bring you back for the, the, the Q&A here in a little bit. So. Um, with that, what I'd like to do is uh, put out just a quick reminder to everyone to use the Q&A feature if you do have questions for any of our panelists. Also a reminder that we are recording this session and also the presentation slides will be available in PDF uh, to those who registered. So look for an email from us once this uh, is over and probably within a day or two, you'll receive a, a follow-up email from the Code Council letting you know where we posted all of this information and where the recording is so that you can go back and visit it and uh, share it with others who may not have been able to join us today. So with that, I'd like to transition into our next round of speakers. Uh, with that, I, I'm glad to, uh, to bring up uh, Edward Latch. So Ed, thank you very much for joining us. I see you on camera there with John Gargiola and uh, John Westcott. Uh, I know that uh, Ed and John are joining us together from um, the, uh, uh, the Floodplain Managers Conference down in Orlando, Florida. And I know that's a busy, busy time down there. Please say hello to our friends there and thank you for taking time out of your, your busy day to see us. So with that, um, Ed, just a, a quick bit about you. So Ed is Director of Planning, Safety and Building Science Division at FEMA. He leads FEMA's mitigation activities, not only for high wind, but flood, earthquake, tornado, wildland fire and other natural hazards in support of disaster resistant building codes and standards. Uh, also, he leads technical services and post-disaster forensic engineering um, for that group as well. So we appreciate all you and your building scientists bring to the table. So welcome today and I'll, I'll have you uh, take it away and then turn over John, uh, turn it over to John and John with introductions here in a bit and I'll back out. The stage is yours. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Uh, thank you, Angie, for your remarks and thank you uh, uh, for that nice introduction. Um, I'm the guy on the, I think the right hand of your screen and John's on the left. So. <laughs> I'll say just a few words before I hand it over to Mr. Westcott, and I'll circle back to you all at the end uh, with a few closing thoughts. 
Uh, next slide, please. Yes. So uh, as you've heard, John Garjola is our lead physical scientist in the building science branch. And along with Jonathan Westcott, uh, another one of our senior civil engineers, both of whom are heavily involved in the building codes and related spaces, they'll be carrying the bulk of this conversation. Uh, but before I turn it over to Mr. Westcott, uh, next slide. I just wanted to say a few words about what FEMA's broad commitment to building codes are. And without repeating anything that Angie may have mentioned, uh, note that uh, our history and connection to building codes goes back almost to the founding of the agency, uh, over 30 years um, and probably, like I said, literally back to the founding of the agency. Uh, we have been working uh, for a long time in the flood peril. Uh, uh, during the last 30 years or so, we've become very active in the earthquake peril, but also the hurricane. Uh, and more recently, a lot of effort and interest is going into wildfire space, tornadoes, and pretty much any other uh, uh, man-made, excuse me, natural, and some man-made hazards that you might think of. Um, the work we have, we have helped advocate for, the work that you have worked with us on, uh, the, the, the partnerships that we have built, we believe has resulted in thousands of building structures being updated, being repaired, or being built using disaster resistant construction. Uh, we like to cite the fact that the uh, international codes, uh, specifically the building codes, residential codes, uh, existing codes uh, meet, or in some cases exceed the National Flood Insurance Program requirements and the requirements of the National Earthquake Hazards Reduction Program. And we, uh, we're very proud of the fact that working with you and others and you're working with the whole building design and construction community, we've made, uh, and we believe we're helping to make the world a safer place. In the last few years, we've been focusing heavily on our collective agency efforts, our building code strategy. Uh, it's resulted in the uh, issuance of a document as well as an internally facing directive that helps direct how FEMA will work together. And you're gonna hear a lot more about that in a minute, about what are we doing and how are we doing it and why is it important to us? Uh, in addition to the actual strategy, we are also working with our federal partners uh, and looking for opportunities to align on those building code activities. And we also have a significant effort, an ongoing effort with some of our other partners at ISO and elsewhere that allows us to help track building code adoption. Next slide. And so uh, one of the study in particular I'll say a word about is the building codes save study. Uh, coming on the, on the heels of the work that the National Institute of Building Science did, NIBS, did on the mitigation and save study, we too have been investing a significant amount of time and effort to, to answer the question of um, if building codes uh, following the international code model have been coming online and have been used for 20 some years, what does that mean in terms of avoided losses? Uh, how much have we really been saving? You've heard that uh, savings of up to $11 for every dollar invested in, in mitigation investment uh, is returned. That's a fabulous thing. And uh, we wanted to add a little detail to that. And one of the things we, we discovered was that um, on an annual basis, we're saving well over a billion and a half dollars just based on what we can measure. And if you extrapolate that between now and the year 2040, uh, we're looking at potentially up to $130 billion or more in avoided losses due to disasters. And so the work we've done there and that we continue to do there we believe are helping to protect uh, all people, including vulnerable and underserved communities. And so uh, we hope that by advancing equity and making resources, policies, and best practices serve all communities, we can make the nation safer. And so with that, uh, next slide. And I believe I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Westcott. So to you, sir. Thank you, Ed. Um... That was a great intro. I'm going to uh, present a quick overview of the strategy's uh, mission and vision and goals and uh, its strategic alignment with our agency's priorities. Um, so the, um, the building code strategy mission and vision statement really underpin our overall approach to improving resilience through building codes. Our vision is the world that we're seeking to build, a safer nation protected in disasters with superior building performance. The mission or purpose of the strategy is to coordinate and prioritize our, prioritize our activities to advance disaster resistant building codes for FEMA programs and for communities nationwide. Well, this effort certainly began at FEMA, it's not staying there. Um, we need uh, everyone's help in order to achieve our mission and vision. The FEMA building code strategy is meant to harness and build relationships with external partners to increase the safety of communities nationwide. 
which is why we're here with ICC during Building Safety Month, promoting building codes. Next slide, please. From the very moment we started drafting the building code strategy, we made sure that uh, some of the themes that Angie mentioned from the FEMA and the FIMA str str strategic plans were present throughout the document, uh, such as reducing the impacts of climate change and increasing equity. With an eye towards the future and the increased frequency of natural disasters, the building code strategy encompasses a theme of reducing climate change impacts. Strong buildings that can survive natural hazards are a critical component of preparedness, response, recovery, and mitigation. Further, we know that disasters do not impact equally. Vulnerable communities and at-risk populations frequently suffer more and recover more slowly. So any strategy seeking to increase FEMA service to the underserved must take this into consideration. Next slide, please. The three goals of the strategy are to integrate building codes and standards across FEMA, to strengthen nationwide capability for superior building performance, and to drive public action on building codes. These goals are supported by 14 more detailed objectives, which break down the high-level goals into achievable activities. With that uh, high-level overview of the strategy and its development, um, now I'm going to go into a, an overview of goal one, followed by some examples. The FEMA building code strategy starts at home with goal one, to integrate building codes and standards across FEMA. From the earliest days of the development of the strategy, we said we must first get our own house in order before we can move into deeper collaboration efforts with our partners. So while goal one is inward focused, the outcomes of our integration of building codes into our programs often results in noticeable benefits externally. And I'll, I'll uh, provide some examples in a moment. Next slide, please. An important first step in integrating building codes and standards across FEMA is relying on high quality, consistent data sources. We have been monitoring hazard resistant building code adoption quarterly since 2007. We evaluate several natural hazards, including flood, hurricane wind, damaging straight line wind, tornado, and seismic hazards. We evaluate if a jurisdiction is at risk of these hazards and whether or not they have adopted modern building codes to address them. We collaborate with our partners from ISO to utilize their Building Code Effectiveness Grading Survey, or BSEGS, code adoption data, which we then supplement and augment with additional research and vetting and Q&A. We make the data available in a web GIS port portal, in addition to the quarterly hazard maps that we've historically produced. One can use the tool to identify which code additions are adopted in a given area, whether any amendments are in place that weaken the hazard resistant provisions and other detailed code adoption notes. Making this data more widely available makes it easier for other FEMA programs to rely on it, as many now do. Our building code adoption tracking and our WebGIS portal help us integrate codes and standards across FEMA by providing that backbone data source that our programs can consistently use. And by the way, we aren't alone in monitoring building code adoption. ICC and also the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes and, and others publish valuable building code adoption information online. And I think John's gonna highlight some examples under goal three. Next slide. Uh, now to kind of jump into some of our programs, I wanna highlight uh, two major FEMA programs that have integrated codes and standards in big ways. First, I'll start with our public assistance program. Let me tell you, when I first started at FEMA, our public assistance program would fund repairs to significantly damaged buildings 
to return them to the way they were before the disaster, or maybe to be compliant with whatever building code a community had in place. In other words, right back to its original vulnerable condition. Not only does this exasperate the damage rebuild cycle, it causes undue burden on communities, doesn't make financial sense, and frankly, we knew how to build better, so why, why weren't we? Well, like Angie, it's been a long time since I first started at FEMA, and I'm happy to say that ever since 2016, PA's policy has been to replace and or restore disaster damaged facilities to the latest published additions of relevant consensus-based codes and standards, regardless of what is adopted by the community, unless that is more restrictive. The policy made so much sense that Congress later followed up by amending the Stafford Act to formally, auth formally authorize PA to do this in Section 1235B of the Disaster Recovery Reform Act. So now, as codes and standards are strengthened over time, so is our public assistance program. This is a game changer for increasing community resilience and an example we want to replicate in other programs. Um, our hazard mitigation assistant grants are another great example of how we're integrating codes and standards across FEMA. Many of our grants support building codes in various ways, as Angie um, highlighted in her remarks. Um, I was going to go, I was going to highlight the Building Resilient Infrastructures and Communities or BRIC grant program, but I think Angie did such a good job in her overview and really um, as director of this program, there was no one better to do it. So um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just say, let's move to the next slide. Thank you. Um, you know, with the PA program and with a lot of brick projects, um, you know, oftentimes those are brick and mortar projects, but it's not always about construction or, or rebuilding. The integration of codes and standards looks different across different programs. For example, our new local mitigation planning policy guide encourages the adoption and enforcement of hazard resistant building codes. It directs planners to address building code building codes and the impacts of old or weakened codes during their capability assessment. The updated guide also encourages participation from the local agency or department that regulates building codes directly in the planning process. This will help code officials be a part of the broader community resilience discussion, enable them to better tap into mitigation grant programs and help them gain broad support for building code improvements. Many of these updates are mirrored across the newly updated state mitigation planning policy guide and also become requirements for enhanced state mitigation plans. So these are just a few examples that illustrate the momentum that codes are gaining throughout our programs. And that's a trend that we aim to continue. Next slide, please. And to that end, last fall, FEMA issued a request for information seeking the public's feedback on how to update the National Flood Insurance Program's floodplain management regulations. These regulations, which provide minimum standards for flood resistant design, that by the way, are weaker than those currently found in the International Building Code and International Residential Code, have been un essentially unchanged for almost 50 years. This request for information is an opportunity for integrating and synchronizing floodplain management regulations and flood provisions in building codes, including the latest consensus flood resistant design standards. We have received and are adjudicating more than a thousand public comments and really appreciate the input we've received from ICC on this. So with that um, overview of, of some examples of how we're uh, Achieving goal one, I'm going to hand it over to my colleague, John and Gargiola, to go over goal two. Great. Thank you so much, John. Um, I'm excited to talk to everyone about um, goal two and highlight uh, some of the activities we and others are, are taking to do what? To strengthen nationwide capability for superior building performance. Uh, this goal is especially important to me because it encompasses a lot 
of what we do here in building science at headquarters. So let's jump in. Goal two, strengthening that capability. We believe that uh, coordination and training and research all together improve building performance and reduce future damage, and most importantly, uh, save lives. Next slide. <clears throat> So strengthening this nationwide capability um, starts right here at FEMA. Um, so um, FEMA has, um, like myself and John, has maintained a cadre of building science uh, subject matter expertise across the regions. Uh, these points of contact are a source for technical support to FEMA programs and communities throughout the region, uh, helping to ensure that the latest building science guidance is leveraged to make buildings safer. Well, while we have those POCs and have had them for decades, we are now in the process of hiring full-time regional building code coordination specialists uh, to advance building codes throughout the regions. And these positions will allow us to develop and maintain our building code expertise. In other words, we are hiring. <laughs> and thanks to our partnership with ICC and others, hopefully you're seeing these um, vacancy announcements, but if you or anyone you know is knowledgeable about hazardous risk and building codes um, and could communicate with about them and wants to join us to help advance codes, uh, please go to usajobs.gov and search for um, FEMA building codes and apply. Um, so there's a position, I think there's a, one or more positions open now, similar ones will be appearing in uh, about six or seven regions. And then by this time next year, we will have new building code uh, SMEs in each FEMA region and at uh, headquarters. So increasing our capabilities is, is that first step, increasing uh, to impacting nationwide capabilities. Next slide. So here are a couple of examples highlight how we're helping to build capacity uh, within our partners and especially those underserved and vulnerable communities. Um, so in terms of providing that financial or technical support, for building codes, um, just highlighting a few programs, but quickly because some of this was mentioned, the hazard mitigation grant program, public assistance, and of, of course, BRIC, as we, we heard that mentioned. So FEMA has long supported post-disaster code enforcement under HMGP uh, under that 5% initiative. Um, so we understand that following disasters, code officials play a critical role in the recovery process in inspecting buildings and reviewing and approving permits for temporary and permanent construction and many other activities. So that is an opportunity for communities to adopt and apply the latest building codes to ensure that damaged buildings are rebuilt as strong as reasonably possible. Um, so under those certain conditions, uh, HMGP can fund building code adoption uh, after a disaster to ensure that those latest codes are used for recovery. Um, and these grants result uh, can result in the adoption of a disaster risk code or um, an improved uh, building code effectiveness grading schedule rating, uh, both of which make communities more competitive uh, for receiving additional mitigation assistance from FEMA in the future. So these projects are often considered seed projects because they facilitate more funding in the future. Um, HMGP can be used for more than just adopting the latest codes. It can cover post-disaster code enforcement costs that exceed the normal costs of the building of the building department. Um, the best time for local communities to enforce disaster resistant building codes is during recovery, and HMGP can help communities do that. Uh, it was also mentioned about the public assistance program. Um, now, following disasters, um, there's section 1206 of the DRA policy. Um, FEMA is providing funding for resources needed to effectively administer and enforce state and locally adopted building codes and floodplain management ordinances for a period of up to 180 days after the date of the disaster declaration. To implement the new provision of the Stafford Act, FEMA issued a policy for building code and floodplain management administration and enforcement in 2020. So the policy defines the framework and the requirements for consistently supporting communities to increase the overall speed of recovery then a further support is needed. Um, um, the hazard mitigation grant program is, is uh, ready to engage. Um, next slide. And it's not just uh, FEMA that's improving nationwide cap capability. 
so for superior building performance. I'm excited for groups like the um, American Society of Civil Engineers who develop and maintain many of the standards that are used for design of buildings and reference in today's building codes and are continually updated right, to improve how buildings are constructed. Um, so ASCE 7, the most widely used standard, uh, has all the prescribed design loads for all hazards, uh, dead, live, soil, flood, tsunami, uh, ice, wind, fire, all of that stuff. Um, so recently, the updated 7-22 edition was released. And for the first time ever, there's criteria for tornado resistant design. Imagine that a, um, a school, say, designed uh, in a tornado prone region um, is better able to resist uh, and survive tornado, not just a, a safe room or a tornado shelter, but the whole school um, and not just schools, uh, but all the buildings where people congregate in large groups or critical facilities. That is the future. Um, so FEMA, along with other fellow agencies like the National Institute of Standards and Technology, worked together, contributed to the development of this updated standard, um, which applies to our most important um, um, categories of buildings. Um, so also another um, exciting news to follow, uh, ASC E722 is all work, also working on a supplement uh, to, uh, to revise to the flood resistant design criteria. So uh, the, what the, what's planned there is to update the mean recurrence interview, interval used for flood design. So we know that the 100 year flood, as John said, uh, a, a standard for the last 50 years is, is not doing its job today. Uh, it, it's kind of um, uh, insufficient for designing for today's flood conditions. So the supplement is looking to establish new recurrence intervals uh, based on a building's risk category um, and, um, and match it up with um, more recurrence intervals are, that are more akin to what we see in seismic and, and, and uh, wind hazards. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Um, also, ASCE has um, an ongoing um, dialogue with hazard modelers and climate scientists to ex explore and examine uh, future conditions and sea level rise that might show up in, um, in the future standards. Next slide. Okay, now we're at uh, goal three, driving the public action. Um, so as I read that and the, the four objectives there, that this is a great goal and it's really very exciting. I know I'm very excited about this goal. So, um, you know, a nation that values and uses codes is, is more resilient. I'm sure you all agree. That value piece is critically important. And, and by, by their actions and investments, we are seeing leadership um, at FEMA, uh, the federal agencies, and this administration place great value in today's codes, uh, probably more than I've seen in, in, in my 22 years at FEMA. So next slide. And how exciting it is to see starting, you know, with, with our president, uh, with the presidential proclamation for Building Safety Month and the recognition that, um, um, that, that building codes uh, are so important uh, to, to keeping our homes and our businesses and, and schools and other facilities safe. Uh, so a great reminder there and uh, as well as the linkage to building codes that could, will contribute uh, in the future to less uh, damage from, from the effects of climate change. Next slide. So partnerships and driving public action uh, means getting out there and meeting stakeholders where we can, where they are, where we can find them, uh, meeting with, with all of you and taking advantage of, of that knowledge and experience um, across FEMA and, and headquarters in the regions and its programs, and as well as our external partners, um, such as the National Code Council, the Federal Alliance for Safe Homes, uh, and new partners that are out there. Um, what new partners should, should FEMA be working with? Um, you know, let us know. Um, so also disasters we know don't impact everyone equally. So we're leading our messaging with equity to ensure that we're reaching all communities and bring a unified communication effort across different channels with fact sheets and videos and events. So you'll be seeing more and more of these kind of uh, products um, you know, in the near future. And we're planning to incorporate building codes into messaging on climate change and, and how building codes play a direct role in the survivability um, through disasters. 
which are likely to increase with the number and intensity in the years to come. Next slide. So here we are today, um, leverage um, existing uh, partnerships, create new partnerships to help out the agency to promote building code messaging. Um, we know we can't succeed uh, just at FEMA, um, but um, getting alignment with the federal agencies, but also critical partnerships in the public and private sector. Um, and, you know, we look at the, uh, the support and messaging and outreach from from partners like we see here, messages uh, um, about um, codes on the Weather Channel, um, campaigns like No Code, No Confidence. Um, we have a longstanding memorandum understanding with the International Code Council. We're working on one also with the Institute for Business Home Safety. So we have a lot of exciting work ahead, um, a lot of partnerships to, to um, currently use and, and explore expanding in the future. Um, so with that, uh, what does all that mean for bringing everything home? So I'm going to turn it back over to Ed. Great. Thank you very much, John. And uh, thank you, uh, everyone, for your, um, uh, for your uh, involvement and for your support. So what does this mean for FEMA? Uh, within our own organization, as you've seen, we felt it was time to come together around a single strategy around a single set of <clears throat> directives and objectives. You've heard a little bit about those. Um, what you have not heard as much about, but what's also going on is we've been talking to our federal partners. We've been finding out what our areas of common interest are and what our areas of common purpose are. Uh, we are developing and completing a report that will help us chart the way forward as we interact with our federal partners and where we go. And as John just finished saying, uh, all this is only as good as our ability to partner and to develop a national implementation plan. We've talked a little bit about the resourcing and the staffing we're doing. We've talked about the tools we've developed, but here we are now, uh, at least in terms of FEMA's effort, at an inflection point where we are pivoting from building and developing a strategy and a common set of goals to now moving towards physically making a difference and implementing. And we know, next slide, that that can only happen through partnerships and that can only happen uh, through you. So uh, our call to action is we need your help to make it happen. Whether it's the No Code, No Confidence uh, initiative that uh, John mentioned and we heard a little bit about, or IBHS's Fortified uh, uh, program, which uh, was part and well, uh, well described, in fact, just this morning at the ASFBM conference, to other groups. Coalition is one example of it, but there's many others. There's many people in this, in this community. Um, we are working and through our resourcing efforts and our new staff, we're creating more bandwidth and we will be, uh, be able to do more. We'll be able to reach out more to you and to folks like you. And so uh, for that reason and for others, we appreciate the opportunity during uh, Building Safety Month to come on and talk to you a little bit about what we're doing and look for opportunities to do even more with you. And I think next slide, mm -hmm. that brings us to the end. And with that, I will turn it back over uh, to you, sir, Mr. Fippinger, and um, thank you very much for allowing uh, Angie, John, John, and myself to come on and tell you a little bit about what we're doing. Absolutely. It's our pleasure. And, you know, we couldn't do Building Safety Month uh, without participation of FEMA. Uh, we've done this for years, and we, we look forward to continuing this fine tradition. So thanks for all of the, uh, the, the good uh, information today. And just a, a, a last plug, I'm going to take the slides down here for a few minutes and ask I see everyone's got their cameras on. I, I think uh, we, we, we set aside some time. We've got maybe 10 minutes remaining here um, and wanted to uh, maybe address some of the, the questions in Q&A and engage maybe a little bit more deeply in some of the stuff that we covered today. So I really appreciate um, the, the panelists. I know that we've been in here kind of live chatting with the audience and Q&A and answering a lot of those questions. So. Um, I, I think we've covered most of those, but um, let me, I'm just kind of skimming the Q&A because my screen changed here a little bit um, in, in the time that I just pulled it down and see if there is anything that we uh, maybe did not get to. So let's see here. I think there was a question. Um, I think there was a quick question in here on, um, Talking about affordable housing is a big uh, discussion point, and I, I think Angie, I don't know if you answered this one, but 
um, you know, how is it that we're we're reaching? And it, this is probably a combination question for all the panelists. How, how are we reaching some of those non-traditional partners out there, and maybe not at the uh, at this you know the traditional state or um, at local tribal tribal territorial level, and maybe getting the message out? And how can we partner with you all to help get that message out um, to to some folks that are dealing with specific issues like affordable housing these days? So uh, messaging, as we said, was the third leg of our stool, um, uh, driving public action. Um, I know our uh, FEMA's external affairs group is hard at work, looking for ways to uh, work with you and work with other partners, uh, looking for ways to talk more about uh, the importance of building codes with local communities. Uh, we know that there are a variety of communities out there on various cycles, uh, update cycles and various recurrent frequencies on how often and how much uh, time and energy they put into updating their codes. We think there are ways to help inform that. We think there are ways to help support communities. Uh, and that we would, we would expect and we believe, particularly some communities that are, are uh, perhaps um, uh, at risk or that uh, communities that have special requirements or special needs or that communities that may not be as economically, um, uh, as economically strong as others, those are communities that in some ways perhaps need more help. So amongst others, I think our, our, us and our external affairs partners are planning to invest some time and energy in some of those over the coming year. That, that, that's that's great answer. Answer. Thanks, I don't, does anyone have any follow-ups on that? If not, I've got another one in the queue here too. Go ahead, Andy. I'll just, I'll just follow on, on that. One of the things I didn't mention, um, but I think is important as part of this conversation of affordable housing is that, um, Two of our programs are part of the, administra the administration's Justice 40 program. So that means that we're looking at um, how 40% uh, of the benefits of our program can reach um, disadvantaged communities. And so one of the big focus areas for us is not only the folks that are currently applying to our programs, but who are not and should be, and how do we reach them? And so that's really where some of these other things like the, the, the phase projects or the capability and capacity building activities or the non-financial direct technical assistance are really meant to come into play is to be able to help with the reach of those folks who really just say, I can't get my foot in the door. And so I think that's just another opportunity there. Um, for reaching and addressing affordable housing issues through our programs. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. I mean, I know that you and I spoke earlier about the non-financial direct technical assistance. Obviously, the Code Council is a big fan of supporting that and expanding that, um, uh, uh, you know, along with FEMA. And, you know, it, I, I think just maybe a quick reiteration of how folks, how simple it is for folks to do that. How would one take advantage of that in the case that they, they missed it in your presentation? No, I, I appreciate that reminder. So um, again, this is the, what we wanna do is again, help people where you are, like what you need support with and building resilience in your community. We want you to be able to put that in as simple a format as possible in a one page letter um, to us. There is an email address so it can go directly to us. Um, that the timing of that is with our, our, our NOFO process. So we'll be, we'll be doing outreach over the summer about the new process for next year. Um, and that allows um, you to be able to submit those, re those requests. We're able to evaluate, figure out what we're able to support and then, um, and then make those selections. In fact, we're getting ready to make the selections for our 2021 cycle. Um, this week um, as well. And so um, those announcements will go out and we'll start our work with um, individual communities to, to provide that support. Our uh, political leadership is extremely supportive of this effort. Um, and we are continuing to look for ways that we can uh, ramp that up for 2021. We um, so are supporting 20 communities and we're looking for ways that we can uh, significantly increase that in the future as well. 
That's great. Um, thank you for that. There's a question in here from Renee, and you know, this is one I think not only for FEMA, but also for the, the code council too, and, and maybe aimed more at the kind of the recovery side of things. So it, it may be a little bit outside of our wheelhouse to completely answer this one today, but how is FEMA, and I would add in the code council too, balancing implementing the most up-to-date codes with cost, current cost of consumers and the agency um, given the high material costs and other, you know inflation and all those factors right now to ensure that all residents and building owners are able to rebuild in a community impacted by a disaster. So I don't know if anybody on the on the FEMA side wants to take that one. I know we're certainly uh, aware and, and conscious of that and, and trying to work with our, our building partners to, to to work on that issue. But um, anyone want to take that from the FEMA side? Maybe Ed or sure. Well, I'll start and um, I'll let others weigh in. Uh, what I would say is, uh, you're right, that's a, this is a difficult question that lies right at the, the heart of the whole concept uh, that FEMA has been so uh, proactive on for all these years of mitigation and taking action now to prevent future losses. And what does the trade-off look like? What, what, what is the right balance for us between additional costs, such as they are, that might be associated with building better and the long-term savings that occur down the road when a disaster hits? And... Uh, as the home builders would like to say, the affordability of housing. Um, it's a difficult question. I can tell you uh, in one way what we're doing is we're studying the question. It's been talked about in broad terms for a very long time, but it has not been very much studied on a, like a cost basis or a, or a time and motion study basis. And we're, we're beginning to start developing information about, as a tactical question, what are the actual dollars and hours and cents of doing these extra things, whether it's it's improved uh, roof sheathing, uh, joint repair like IBHS promotes, or additional nails or straps, or whatever it happens to be, or elevation, all the things that go into this, uh, to see if we can put a little more specificity into what is the trade-off between dollars and materials invested and avoided losses. I mentioned the building code save study it says doing these things right and doing them right the first time saves billions. And while billions are huge numbers, that doesn't necessarily help Joe Homer or Susie Homeowner with a decision they have to make right now about do I do I do I add these things or don't I do I add uh, hot tub or do I add roof straps? Uh, we think in the end that the cost of doing these things is relatively small. I'm not going to say non-existent, but it's relatively small and readily fits within uh, a calculation if you want to look at somebody's monthly mortgage. Uh, we like to think in terms of is it worth an extra $50 a month on your mortgage to do the things that it needs to keep your house from either falling down or being blown down or flooded or whatever else it is? And um, we think those costs are well justified anytime, even in a time of shortage, because it never makes sense to build in a way that's not going to survive. No, thanks for that. And I, I think from the Code Council's perspective, you know, we're I guess it's worthy of a reminder that, um, you know, particularly public infrastructure under the um, uh, disaster recovery fund, you know, that's going to be scalable in terms of award and, and so forth, too, that, um, you know, while I don't want to speak for the agency, it, it, it has more of a direct impact on that if it's a 75, 25 percent disaster or, you know, a, a 90, 10 or even 100 um, percent. I, I think those factors come into play and where we can help is with uh, some of that in kind or uh, the, the percentage that's on the local community, particularly to do with infrastructure and coming up with um, assistance to be able to um, address that that piece. So whether that be the in kind um, or staff time, some of those things that, that we can help um, share some knowledge on with our building code officials and uh, builder partners to, to be able to make up that piece. I think that certainly helps a little bit too with uh, uh, with all that you just said. So hopefully uh, folks see us as a resource and, and our other partners as a resource on that too to kind of help get there. So um, I know that we are running short on time. So I think unfortunately that's going to be the uh, the end of the questions here today. I do have a few um, just quick housekeeping notes. So I'm gonna go ahead and share screen again here. And I didn't want to leave without sharing um, FEMA's um, slide uh, that has some of their links in it here too. So you'll see the link to the building code strategy. 
uh, FEMA Building Science homepage and then the FEMA Building Science helpline. I know that at least in one case that uh, John Westcott addressed that in the Q&A today. So that would be the one, that helpline would be the one, um, I, I believe, uh, John, that that's, that's where you directed folks for um, doing their BCAD updates and, and uh, most recent codes and everything too. So I see a, a quick head nod there from you. So thanks for, for doing that. Again, these will be, all of these slides will be PDF and available to you. If you signed up, you'll get a, an email from us about it. Uh, last but not least, uh, I'd be remiss in giving you, uh, it, without giving you a, just a quick update on a, a piece that we're focusing on at the Code Council during Building Safety Month. Uh, our Government Relations Department is working with our membership department to uh, boost membership, individual and uh, governmental membership. So, you know, we wanted to talk a little bit about some of the benefits of, of being an ICC member. Um, you know, getting a free digital codes premium subscription, uh, depending on your membership category, that is an enormous benefit. And we've seen lots of uptake uh, in the use of digital codes premium, 10 to 25% off of code books uh, and other publications and training materials, discounts on training, um, certification exams, resource materials, and then um, showcasing your membership with newly added uh, digital badges on social media and on your resume. So uh, any of this and, and accessing technical support come along with your ICC membership. Um, and that goes a long way in being able to help us to do these kinds of things and the, and the partnership that we have with FEMA and some of our other partners that were certainly mentioned here today. So um, with that, I'll, I'll end by saying again, a thank you, leave you with my contact information uh, and email as well as our our main uh, government relations email address, which is advocacy at ICCSafe.org. So if you'd like to follow up with us, please either hit me directly or use that advocacy address to reach our uh, GR department more broadly. Again, thank you to Angie, to Ed, to John, and to John today for joining us. Uh, this, again, has been recorded and will be posted on the ICC website and uh, posted up on YouTube here very shortly, along with a PDF copy of the slides. So um, thanks very much for joining us today, and we will catch up with you. Hopefully, we'll, we'll see you again uh, next year, but also come back and join us next week for water safety in and, and week four. Happy Building Safety Month, and thanks so much.